Um, so scaling, post, uh, scaling wall performance. Uh, how many people here run Postgres 24-7 in a write-heavy uh, OLTP type workload? Like, right, some of you. If you haven't done that before, then this is probably going to be a little uh, new. If you have done this, then you will be very familiar with what it means to have apply lag and replication lag. So what is wall? It's the write-ahead log that Postgres uses. It uses it for a number of reasons. Performance and recoverability are the primary two things. Um, quick background and where it is, just in case you don't know where it is or what it is. Um, inside of your PG data directory, you have your wall files, which is conveniently known as PGX log, and I believe that was renamed in 10. Um, pardon me, I am actually behind the times. But uh, the other you know, primary chunk of, of data that's on disk is, is uh, the heap or your data files themselves. So wall files, you've all seen these wonderfully named files. There's actually a lot of information packed in them, and it's very important and useful. Uh, for figuring out where you are in the world, and we will get to using that shortly. So when you go and create a database, uh, a little bit of background about the physical storage, because uh, accelerating wall performance has to do with actually um, helping Postgres talk to the underlying storage. When you go and create a database, it actually goes and, and creates a new directory un under your uh, base directory there. Um, and it picks out a random number, that's your database ID, if you're uh, familiar with poking at system catalogs. Uh, at that point in time, you can actually go and do something with your uh, database and start to see the file system change. So you can actually figure out where on your file system a given relation is. So in this case, of creating a table, T1. I go and figure out where the file path is, and it hands me back a directory or a, a path that's relative to PG data. Okay? And if I go and look at that file, it's created this you know, stub of a file. It's empty. It's truncated. But when I go in through and actually perform some kind of a modification or, or DML, then at that point in time, the insert goes and triggers some form of I.O. and voila, we've, we've got you know, actual data on disk. A lot happens between that SQL and that data showing up on disk. The important part to know here is that by default, and I've screwed around with this and I don't recommend it, um, is changing the, 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 the page size. But um, all I.O. shows up in 8K chunks on disk. Okay. Um, all modifications, all your tuples, everything else um, will somehow materialize as, as AK uh, units on disk. So how does wall relate to the heap? Those are the two things that you're primarily concerned with inside of your PG data directory. First one is, is, is um, when you go to go in and perform some type of a DML, in order to be crash safe and in order to allow concurrency, um, Postgres goes in and writes each individual operation inside of a transaction to the wall file. Okay? Um, and that's just in a sequ sequentially appended to, you know, ever-growing um, file that, that comes in 16 meg chunks. Um, when you commit something, and I'm simplifying a, a fair amount here, but when you c commit something, then that transaction in your wall stream has the ability to be replayed back into the heap. Okay? There's an in-memory representation of this and what's in wall. And as long as Postgres doesn't die, until that checkpoint completes and it happens periodically in the background, the data on, in your wall file, the, the wall files actually have the, the committed transaction until that checkpoint happens and it moves the data into your heap. And then the last part is, is and this is an interesting one, is, is um, when Postgres crashes, potentially, it goes and walks backwards, right? When I say that, that the wall file is continually being appended to, when Postgres crashes because it lost its in-memory state, it has to go to disk, goes and starts walking backwards through your wall file until it finds a completed transaction, at which point it goes and reapplies uh, the transactions to the heap and then starts the process. Um, and I glossed over a pile of details there, but that's what's important for now. Um, from a performance perspective, we always heard for a while, especially when we had spinning disks as our primary medium, um, to go and take your transaction logs and move them off to a separate set of, of disks or spindles. And that's basically because the, the I.O. performance or the characteristics of wall is sequential append, which is very different than your heap. Your heap is all random I.O., generally speaking, and your wall is sequential write. Right? Very rarely do you go through and do sequential read. You do that when you do checkpoints and whatever else. But for all intents and purposes, your, your, the, wall, the I.O. characteristics of wall versus your heap, very different. Um, let's see. And then in most cases, 
Wall is a, your performance friend. If you really push things hard, wall is not your friend. But under the hood, when we did that insert to begin with, it goes and stacks tuples into a page. Right? And this information, where, the, where these 8K pages are and where tuples are in relation to that 8K page, that is all encoded as a wall stream and sent off. Uh, Bruce has done a bunch of really good talks on this, which is where I, I snag these visualizations from, and there's some background. I'm, I'm not going to get too much further into this, but it is worth knowing that inside of an 8K page you have tuples, and these tuples uh, and the, the uh, operations to change these tuples or to, to do those mutations is encoded in the wall stream. That's the important part there. Okay. So we're talking about wall and we're talking about replication. So um, the reason that I came to discover this particular problem um, was because of something that we had at work, which is a, an HTTP front end to ZFS, effectively. Um, so Manta is, is loosely an object storage, um, and all of its metadata though, is stored in Postgres. That's the important part. Um, so if you're going to firehose a bunch of data at this type of a system, you're going to be under a uh, 24 by 7 write intense workload. Okay? And because you don't want to lose, lose data or whatever, um, and because CAP is still a thing, um, you need to replicate that information. And so you know, when you wanted to go and do this, and do this in a durable way, uh, you don't just rely on replication on, you go and set remote write, which means that the, the follower here has acknowledged the write from the primary. Okay. It's asynchronous between this follower and this, the, the, this, or the, the, the first follower and the async. Right, so you can call it the primary, the secondary, and the async, however you want to do it. The important part is, is that between the primary and the follower, you've set your synchronous commit to be remote write. When you do that, uh, and you have a failover, um, life gets complicated. Because when you want to fail over, you can't fail over. There's no availability to this until you get to a point where the follower has recovered. Okay. And if you note the dates, this is exactly when PG Prefolder came into existence. Um, the, uh, you, you'll see this replication lag. That's 19 hours, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Okay. If you hook Postgres up to some form of real-time system, this is a problem that you will encounter if you have a high write volume. Laws of physics. Yeah. So how do we get into this? Uh, Postgres, nice piece of software. Love its durability characteristics. It is single threaded. So if you wanted to go and do this insert, you insert it into the primary. The primary goes and injects that record, that tuple, the DML, that operation, into the wall stream and sends it over to the follower. Okay. Um, if you have many inserts, Right? then you've got lots of I.O. concurrency and lots of things driving your storage controller on the primary. On the follower, you do not have that. Right? So what that means is the primary is able to benefit from all of these connections, all of these inserts, all of this scheduled I.O. coming into the primary and its disk system. Hopefully it's cache even. Right? It's a, the follower is not. So if you look at what kind of a sequence diagram of this looks like, if you're lucky, this is what the interaction looks like between Postgres right, and, and the rest of the, the box. The file system cache is able to return back those pages really quickly so that when Postgres goes to, to make a change to an 8K page, that that page is already in memory. And when that happens, this zips through pretty quickly. But that's not what happens, especially when your working set is larger than memory. And what happens then is you have your wall page, hits the file system cache, it's missed, going to miss. You go back and do disk, hit, do some form of disk I.O., and you, you know, round trip this. And unfortunately, it's not that simple, right? Because when I say that we're able to move through quickly, we're able to move through quickly at microsecond speeds, which is great because we're inside of a single box, but if we have to go talk to a second subsystem, we're into a world of hurt because 
this is not to scale, and orders of magnitude kick in, and 15 milliseconds is an eternity, right? So not much to be done about that, right? So, and then it becomes really frustrating. Who's seen Postgres crash, recover, start, whatever, and the box is just sitting there recovering or applying? Everybody should raise their hand for this. Like, and everybody should be screaming because you're like, I've got a bunch of disks. There is no reason on God's green earth that these disks should not be lit up and the box white hot because there's nothing else going on in the box. It should be recovering at full speed, and instead, it's not. Right? And it is the most maddening thing because normally this happens after some form of an outage or an outage recovery is blocked waiting for this recovery process to finish. So you're just irate when this happens. And the reason it happens is because you have either a wall receiver or apply recovery process. doesn't matter. It's a single process scheduling I.O. So despite all your best efforts to go in and improve this, it won't happen. Those theoretical 2400 IOPS that you have in your box and your server are never going to be used. Right? You're stuck at, if, if you're lucky, 6% utilization of your disk, 0% IO because it's dispatching 150 IOPS a second and that's it. And you're entirely bound uh, or blocked on the speed at which that disk system will return results back to you. Right? And then worse, if you have a busy primary, because this same phenomena exists for startup and for followers, a busy primary will permanently overrun your follower. You have infinite replication lag because you're able to generate more I.O. on the primary than you can satisfy on the follower in a single threaded context. So when you deploy the pre-falter, life gets better quick. This is repli uh, replication age based off of the, the wall timestamps. So this is a little fuzzy. If you look at the peak there at the apex, I just didn't, I wasn't able to find the graph for that uh, in time. But if you look at that apex there, between there and here, you look at the number of outstanding wall records and it is just, it is 100% linear to ground and it runs it to ground. And at that point in time, everything is hunky-dory for the rest of its life. So it's a neat solution, but it's kind of the wrong problem. But how do you fix it? Right? Uh, the intention was is that this piece of software would be able to be used, be quickly deployed. Um, I've been doing Postgres administration for a number of years, and I've run into this, and I've always had to tell people, there's nothing you can do. You just have to wait. Right? Checkpoint, n like, that's just it. There's, there's nothing else. Um, so if you download and install, very simple configuration. Start to give away some of the secret sauce here. Um, Set up your, your log level there, configure Postgres, and then specify a path to your xlog dump file. And that's roughly it. When you fire it up with that configuration, it basically drives itself. So in this case, this is running on the, my laptop here. Um, what this will do is it connects to Postgres in this case. It goes and interrogates the system. Uh, to go and figure out where it is in the wall stream. And this is running on the primary. And it basically says there's nothing for me to do, it skips. Right? It, and on the primary, it's a no op for the time being. On the follower, in this case, this is a new cluster, so there's not much to do. But it's the exact same configuration file, effectively. The only difference is the port numbers. Um, and it goes and fires up a bunch of IO threads, wall workers, whatever else to do. This is and basically run the machine as, as, as hard as it can and when it needs to. So what's it do? Right. It looks for wall files. It goes and processes them using pgxlock dump to go and extract the necessary meta information. And for better or worse, it actually it parses out the text. I was a little unhappy about some of this. I went down the rabbit hole of writing a wall parser. And I know I talked to a couple people last night who have experience doing this for the 9.2 days. That's actually when this software was, was born, was in Postgres 9.2. Um, and that was a terrible wall log format. Uh, thank you to whoever was involved in, in updating that for 9.5, 9.6, and on. Um, because we can actually have kind of the, the, this utility, xlog dump, and then also a, a much more sane representation of, of uh, wall information. Anyway, it processes the output of pgxlog dump, 
figures out where in all these files the uh, pages are that are potentially going to need to be modified by the apply process, goes and dispatches pread calls in order to prime the, the operating system's cache. And as a result, when the apply process comes through, it's able to get cache hit between the operating system, or between Postgres and the operating system. Um, and the stats for that are recorded, um, running at north of 99.99% efficacy. It, it's significant. So when we were doing, when I was doing this, where do you go to find your, your wall files? There's two primary places. One of them is, is you can go look in the system catalogs, which is great if you have a running Postgres instance. But if you have a crashed primary, that doesn't do you any good. You want to get back online. So if you've got your process title set to have hints for where you are, it will tell you it's recovering segment, whatever. Uh, Prefalter will go and parse that out of the PS proc title, go in and actually just blindly go and snag those wall files, parses them, runs them through. And then once it catches up and Postgres is able to start, it'll go and connect to the database and then begin processing what's in the system catalogs. Uh, this has taken um, hours of startup on primary down to seconds, like 15 seconds, um, on 100 gigs worth of uh, uncheckpointed wall segments. So run a very, very abusive PG bench test, uh, crank your wall segments out to you know, 100, 200 gigs, whatever you want, run that until it starts recycling wall files before a checkpoint runs, kill nine the, the primary, run PG prefalter, and it will start up in a matter of seconds. Like, it's like 15 seconds. It's, it's substantial compared to um, what you would see if you ran this on uh, without it. Um, like I said, shout out to PGXLock Dump. One of the things that's nice about this is it provides a nice clean interface so that as Postgres evolves, um, as long as the information is available and extracted, and, and, and presented by a PGX log dump, this strategy will continue to work. There's not the tight coupling between PG Prefalter and uh, Postgres. There, there, there's a really nice boundary there. Um, I wish that this you know, exported something that was a little bit easier to parse than just plain text, um, but that's a, my own personal feature request. I may go and, and implement like a JSON output or something. So what does it actually do? This is Prefalter in a nutshell. So we've got a bunch of wall files. Prefalter goes and fires off xlog dump file, uh, programs, primes, and IO request queue. The things that if you're in this situation, you are IO starved, right? That's, the, that's why we're in this situation to begin with. So Prefalter goes and creates this IO queue. It does two things. It, go, or that's a, uh, it goes and makes sure that it hasn't already prefaulted in the entire wall file, um, and it dedupes, uh, dedupes duplicate wall files that are coming into the system. It does the same thing for IO caches. It does it on the page boundary so that you're not ever spending a disk stroke or cycles um, attempting to fault something into the OS that um, has already been faulted in or um, has potentially like a slightly different offset. The reason is, is in our case, we we're using ZFS as the file system and we didn't want to artificially taint the ARC cache by artificially promoting something into the brain fart, I forget, I think it's the MFU um, uh, list when we only needed to read it once on the apply side of things. And then coming out of the file descriptor cache, it goes in and hits the IO threads. And as a result, like from, if you've got duplicate modifications to the same page, it won't go and fault that in again. So all of the IO being dispatched by PG Prefalter is 100% random as far as the operating system is concerned. It's deliberately simple to install. It's deliberately simple to run. Um, use it on the primaries, use it on your followers. Um, it's useful at startup and for failover. Go snag it. Um, I know I went through that quick, um, but I do have a demo environment set up if we did want to poke at it. But this is, this is really the, the gist of it, is instead of hours, this finished in, in this particular case, this was a really busy system because it was still doing read-write for the actual production traffic as it was recovering. Um, yeah. Go ahead, questions? Do you have the synchronous commit turned 
Yeah. If you have remote write, yeah. Right. Synchronous commit is local. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so there's 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 remote write, which means that the primary issued a write over the network, and it was acknowledged by the follower. Um, by the receiver process, and all that does is it goes and dumps that file to disk, and I forget if it acknowledges it before it dumps it. There's two separate, what, one, there's a second setting which is, it turns out really pathological, um, called synchronous apply, where in that case, it ships the modification, the operation to the follower, and then the follower waits to actually apply that record. And if you're in the situation where I had the graph earlier, your transaction will block for 19 hours until it gets through that queue. And that is the ultimate back pressure and F you to the rest of your application. Because good luck with your uptime. Go ahead. Uh, why do you, P read? Oh, um, I just know that that's what it's doing under the hood. It's doing a seek and a read at the same time. And I know that when I go in and issue that to go um, from tracing, that it's using a P read. That's all. That's true. Yes. Uh, F advise is Linux specific. Uh, in this particular case, I didn't have access to that. So is it? Well, I'm, I'm not, in this case, I wasn't writing on, but yeah, that's good to know. I, I can. Uh, my limitation was not in memory bandwidth on the follower, or the primary or the follower. It is I.O. bound, and I had memory bandwidth to burn. So uh, faulting in and copying an extra, what, 2,400 times 8K is not a huge amount of, of you know, bus to, to waste. But yes, you're right. That would be a good optimization. I will take an issue for that, and I may get to it. <laughs> Yes. Synchronous commit equals on is not just local. Local is one of the options for synchronous commit. On means that your follower like, is actually flat. Like in sync, if, if you're in a synchronous uh, streaming replication mode, the, the replica also has to have the same sync. It has the, but it has the data, but you don't know where it is in its apply stream. The remote apply, I think, is the. Remote, remote apply. Remote apply is new, I think. Yeah. Remote apply is new, but synchronous commit on is. There's net and apply. I have to go back and look at this. It's been like nine months. There we go. Right. Yeah. Right. Because you're sitting here appending, and it all it does all when, I, when all this stuff means is like it's it's been journaled out to disk at the end of this wall file, but it hasn't been moved into the heap. And on failover, that information needs to be in the heap. Go ahead, Grant. So, I mean, obviously, like the tool you're talking about, like we built something like Polar totally. World that's very similar, like 20 years ago. Right. Same kind of problems back on sort of logical apply days. And even if it's over single threaded, like this mm -hmm. sort of common technique, right? I'm sure people, we didn't probably invent it. I'm sure someone mm -mm. has been doing this forever and different things. Um, so, this is like a useful tool when you have the massive fall behind kind of problem, mm -hmm. or you just, you know, it's about faulting pages in. Right. You know, but I think the interesting. We've seen some other stuff where it's, it's actually about the apply. Yes. And, and you know, like D3 delete and those kind of problems where the, to get that a single threaded apply, it takes longer, even if everything's in memory, than it does on the other side. You know, yeah. Do you have any comments on that for people? No. Um, what, what the pre filter does is when in these, whoa, I forgot to turn off animations. I'm so sorry. Oh my god. I will get there. I swear. Oh wait. Touch bar. I've actually never used that before. It's <laughs> the reason I moved to a new laptop. Um, so in this uh, out of xlog dump, it goes and takes all of the um, related pages as well. And so in that regard, the 
Um, when you go ahead. They'll all be in memory. Right? They'll all be in memory, right? I can't do much more than that, really, because all I'm I'm playing with is the OS. Yeah. One of the things that I did note that was really frustrating is because I knew that, the, and I was, I'm playing around with like live data here, right? I'm doing this all read only, but man, I really wish I had an extra like control or guard against something. Um, and not being able to run the pre-filter, for instance, as its own UID, also inside of the data directory, was something that drove me insane. Because Postgres does this really convenient, helpful, you know, you know, mother may I check of making sure that your data directory is mod, you know, seven zero zero. And I really like. I got so close to patching that out. <laughs> yeah, I was just pointing out that like you can still have problems. Not usually like the 19-hour behind problem. But yeah. You can have problems on workloads where, like, just because it's still staying single threaded, like you cut down how long any of those I, loops are, but if you still have the loops happening and it's longer than the loop was on the. So if you have a high cardinality index or low cardinality index with a huge, yeah, then you run into that exact problem. And that is also a thing that, like, this helps with, doesn't solve it, yeah, yeah. right? Like, because that's entirely inside of, you know, Postgres or wherever Postgres is interfacing with the OS. I was just trying to make sure people do yeah. that, like, this gets rid of one of the... One of the big ones, yeah. So this helps with, with, with uh, two particular types of lag. One of them is, is apply lag on the follower. It helps with startup time, recovery time. Um, and then also checkpoint lag. Um, so one of the things that it'll do is, is when it starts up, it'll read through where the next checkpoint segment is, and it'll go and pre-fault all the pages for what's going to be checkpointed next. Wow. And that also is a big deal. And that's, it took a long time to figure out that there's also this third type of lag, which is checkpoint lag. Um, and there's consequences to that. <laughs> so, question. Yes. Because if you have a remote apply, you have the same kind of lag. Yes. Um, so, it, yeah, it does. Um, PGX log dump, the way that I've, I've wired that up is it's using the follow or like tail F type semantic. Um, and so as the data comes in and gets written out to the wall file on any follower, PGX log dump streams that out and that immediately goes into the IO queue and is applied immediately. So um, assuming that there's at least a little bit of stutter, that first I.O. will probably be caught by Postgres, and then all future I.O. will likely be caught by the pre-falter until Postgres catches up, and very rarely does Postgres actually go and issue a, an I.O. for you. Um, it does happen, but it's only at the boundary where it's already cut up, so it's like, yeah, I don't really care that much. Question, go ahead. Import this? I would love to see that happen. Um, it's written in Go. It's intended to be portable. It only ported it to 9.6 at the moment. It's a very easy set of changes to make it 10 and 11. I was going to hopefully do that before tomorrow. Um, so that would be great to do. I, I, this is 100% load bearing. Without this, we go down. Right? Um, I, I can't stress that enough. <laughs> and I, I wish I actually had a count for you of the number of you know, billions of IOs at this point in time that have gone through this as a result. Um, but yeah, that would be a really good idea because when we ran into this, we were like, we had to kind of uncover and, and pull back the sleeves and there was a bunch of very fantastic debugging that went into kind of figuring out what was going on in the union of, of the operating system in Postgres to, you know, what was really happening here. And it, once we kind of got a handle on the problem, it was, it was reasonably straightforward to kind of figure out a design to go in and build a solution around it. But yeah, it would be... I think that the number of people that have sworn or the amount of downtime that has been caused because of startup or you know, other very easy to prevent issues or, um, with pre-falter, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a smart idea. <laughs> I, I would be very much in favor of that. It seems like a nice compliment to something like PG3.1 that also helps. Uh, yeah, they're doing similar. That is part of the heap already. Right. So the, the, the so they're good and bad. So I, there's actually an open a GitHub issue for use of prewarm. The only problem with prewarm is I can only use prewarm when P Postgres has already started. Right. And I, we've done um, just like files. Yeah. Every, like the, yeah. Uh, so that's that's exactly it. Like uh, the the suggestion for everybody else was like running into the, the base directory there and catting the files to dev null in order to fault them in either the wall files or the tables themselves. Both actually. Um, but like the, in the case of, of um, counting random table files, you may have 
some understanding of where you're going to be in, in relations because you're like, that's a busy table and I'm just going to fault that entire table in. Um, but that's kind of like the pharmaceutical analogy of like taking oil and you know pouring it over the entire engine block if you need to like refill your like you're, you're spray and pray. It's not. Yeah. I don't need that. Right. If I've That's exactly it. Like, I've got a, you know, 10 terabyte table. I really like to, to recover. I only care about, like, you know, 16 megs divided by 8, like the number of, of tuples referenced in the number of wall segments that are unapplied. That's it. And that's a really small amount. But, like, I don't know where that needle in the haystack is. And Prefalter goes and lets me surgically go in and, you know, fault those individual records into the OS. And it's on the order of megabytes. Right? It's not huge. And so, like, I'm happy to burn that to begin with. And, and potentially you're going to be spend time pre-faulting the unimportant things first, and you're, you're blocked waiting for like the important things, which may be somewhere else in that heap cache. So yeah, all those problems like basically kind of go away. Um, so pre-warm would be great. Uh, there is an open issue, like I said, to have pre-falter warm a cache. Um, it wasn't terribly important in practice, um, and I never implemented it because like this was effective enough. So uh, yeah, but it would be great. Like you know, patch is welcome. Um, I would definitely review and merge those. I would love to hand this off to somebody. I'm actually not using this. I'm like, it's in production. I just, well, no, you don't I don't, I don't know. It yeah. done, it's done. So on that chart from yeah. uh, what was it, 4 p.m. on August 3rd? Yeah. 8 a.m. to August 3rd to 4 p.m. August 4th? Yeah. Is that how long it took you to process it? Uh, this was three weeks. Okay. Um, it was a really intense three weeks, but yeah. And then there was a little bit of testing. Um, there's a bunch of work that went into like, like learning how LSN was structured and some of the other items and building libraries to go and do that that was type safe so that I never had to like worry about dorking something up in the future because one of the early versions I had a math error um, and I just, it was a type safety issue effectively or something the type system would have caught and I was like, I'm in a type safe language so let me go and do this. <laughs> um, so there was a little bit of time doing that so that I would never have to go back and revisit these types of problems. So. Yeah, it was it was reasonably short sprint, but under duress, done in hate, rage. No, same thing. Yeah, um, let me think. Actually, let me think. If I had said that wrong. Yeah. You could use it in that case. Yeah, it's it's the same problem. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can. Yeah, the other one, like the fact that, that on the primary, you're able to schedule all the I.O. And when you go into your particular thing, there is no hint to your follower that any of these blocks need to be in memory, right, like zip. So the, in this case, you would hugely benefit from that because Postgres, or the prefalter is only looking at the file system here and the box itself, and it can actually go and recover this stuff for you. Right. Um, and then just to, to comment on the, the tuple cache and the like, is when the prefalter goes to execute, it actually records the, the, um, the page itself, not the tuples inside of the page. 
It does do deduping of individual tuples into the same page so that it processes this request for that page only once. So, other questions? Go ahead. Uh, someone mentioned like maybe having some utility in Core, but wouldn't it be possible to actually have like, the apply process do this effectively? Like, yes. still apply in a single thread, but have other threads that would be so. Slow before I looked into doing this as a sidecar, I was like, hmm, Postgres, threading. This is going to be tricky. Uh, <laughs> it's a complicated relationship. Um, but in, in truth, it would actually make the most sense if Postgres did pick up a threaded worker pool in. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and it would have the, the intelligence to go and read the wall stream as it was coming in and then go in and demand load into the OS, um, all of those pages, that would be great, right? Then this would have never had to have happened. And I would have gotten back, you know, some gray hairs. So, yes, but the conversation of like, how do you get something to solve this problem done quickly? Using C is not the right answer. <laughs> Good. Yep, that's a good question. Um, so each one of these caches are sized. So the file descriptor cache is just an upper bound. It's a simple LRU. The IO cache is actually an ARC cache internally, um, is what it's using as a data structure. And it's sized for, I think, 100,000 operations. So it's reasonably bounded. Um, and then the wall cache is whatever the max wall segments is times two. So it does age through this stuff reasonably quickly. This sidecar process is like 10 megs. Does that answer your question? Okay. If it doesn't, ask me. Other questions? Please go use this. It feels, oh, go ahead. Yes. Mm-hmm. It, that would be great if it happened. Some, like, it's just the fastest way to solve this problem because this was a problem that was born out of production need was like to not go and do that. Um, I, I spent an afternoon looking at it. I'm like, this is doable. But then at the same time, I was looking at some of the things that, that Robert had done for like Parallel. And I was just like, eh, this is not a nice fit because what I really want is effectively to go and dispatch a bunch of P threads and go and do, because that, as a, for portability purposes so that it actually could be used. Um, but at that point in time, like you're kind of in uncharted territory, like there's not a concept of threat abstraction inside of Postgres. So, um, um, yeah, but like I said, uh, th at this point in time, like it's load bearing for us. I don't know of a lot of people that are using it. I would encourage people to use it, especially if you have had slow startups, slow failovers. It's intended to make the use and operation of Postgres less painful, right? Like, it's a tool that, that's solving the wrong problem well, potentially, right? Like, Postgres should do some of this stuff differently, but since it doesn't right now, it's an effective hack until something better happens. All right? Oops. Well, thank you, unless there are more questions. Or I can do a demo, but it's not. Yeah. Great.